So this morning, I wanted to start the introduction to the book of Revelation to hopefully whet your appetite a little bit. That in case normally you don't come on Wednesday night, you're going to go, you know, I'm going to start coming on Wednesday night because 2024 is a new year and I've recommitted my life to Christ and I'm going to start coming to church on Wednesday night. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to whet your appetite a little bit. Uh, because we're not going to be doing Revelation on Sundays, it'll be on Wednesdays unless I get the really juicy parts and then I'll do it on, on Sundays. So this morning, uh, my outline is this, in case you're, you're ever writing it down. The purpose of Revelation. Why did God give us the book of Revelation? And second, the person of Jesus Christ, and then the preparation of the church. So those are my three points, and I'm going to begin with the purpose of Revelation. Why did God inspire John to write down these events? Why did he give us the book of Revelation that's been passed down from generation to generation? Well, the first thing, and there are three, three reasons why he gave it to us, is to inform you, to increase your knowledge to bless the world with some information. Listen to verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants, the church, things which must shortly come to pass. So the title of the book is Apocalypsis in the Greek, which means the disclosure, the revealing, the uncovering of information that has now become available to you. It's like somebody's pulling the curtain back and you're going to see things in the book of Revelation you will not see in any of the other 65 books of the Bible. We are blessed with detailed information that's found nowhere else. Information about the spiritual conditions of the seven churches in Asia Minor. How were they actually doing in the eyes of God and not in the eyes of mankind? We get to see a description of heaven. How cool is that? I mean, we get a detailed description of the throne room of God of the colors that surround the throne of God, of the lightnings and of the sounds that are taking place, we get a description of the four beasts that cease not crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We get to see a description of the 24 thrones sitting in the 24 elders sitting on those thrones that surround the throne of God and how they will fall at the feet of God and cast their crowns at His feet. We know from the description of Revelation that 10,000 times 10,000 angelic beings will bow and begin a chorus of worship. Can you imagine that? I mean, a sea of glass before the throne. This, this is absolutely incredible that we get to see what's taking place in heaven that we really don't see anywhere else. We get detailed events of what will take place during this time called the tribulation, the opening of each of the seven seals, the blowing of each of the seven trumpets, the pouring out of each of the seven bowls of wrath. But most important, John will describe for us our glorified Christ. And this is incredible. Because oftentimes we look at Jesus as a little baby in a manger. That's what we put in a little nativity scene. Or we see him crucified on the cross or, or being kind... And, and we see him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, but now we're going to see him as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and we will see Jesus in his glorified state. And I'm telling you something, when we see these facets of Jesus that we've not seen anywhere else, it should inspire you. So the first reason we got Revelation is to inform us. That would be the interpretation of the Scripture. But the second part is the application, and that's meant to inspire you. It's meant to cause you to do something, to change, to be better than you were before, to be more active than you were before. It's meant to inspire you. Uh, the book of Revelation inspires me because as I look at those seven letters to the church of Asia Minor, it, it inspires me not to be lukewarm like the Laodicean church where Jesus said, I would that that were cold or hot, but you're lukewarm and you make me sick. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. I don't want to be lukewarm. It inspires me. That's why I get up here and act the way I do. It's not that I'm trying to put on a show. I'm telling you I mean business. It inspires me to not leave my first love like the church at Ephesus left their first love. That they let other things come between them and Christ. That they love more than they love God and His appearing. 
I don't want to leave my first love. The Bible says I should love the Lord thy God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, and with all my mind. And I don't want to leave that. I don't want to be like the church at Sardis that had a reputation for life, but in reality they were dead. And everybody said, oh, look at that church. Oh, that's a good church. Oh, they're alive. And, and, and God said, you got a reputation that you're alive, but in essence you're dead. You're living on past laurels, your past reputation. I don't want to live on what we did in 2023 or 2022. I want to be alive today, this worship service, for God to anoint this place, for God to speak to my heart here now and not just in the past. These letters remind me that I have a window of time to repent and to reap the harvest. These letters to these churches remind me that I don't have forever to repent if God speaks to my heart. If God speaks to my heart, I should act. Because he may not speak again. If God asks me to get off the bench, it's like a coach saying, it's time to go in the game. If I ignore him and say no, he may not ask me again. I've got a window of time to reap the harvest of the fields. It's white in the snow. I don't have forever. I've got to listen to God. I've got to pay attention to the time that I've got. Revelation 21 reveals to me that there's a great white throne judgment that all those whose names are not found in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, fire and brimstone. Is he lying? He's telling the truth and if you understand that, every lost person who's never given their heart to Christ will spend an eternity in a burning fire hell. That should inspire you. It inspires me to share my faith in Christ. It inspires me to sign up for mission trips. It inspires me to give of my time, my talent, and my treasures to the Lord. I'm driven by the knowledge that one day, I will stand before holy God and give an account for how I live. What'd you do with that time I gave you, Sam DeVille? What'd you do with that money I gave you, Sam DeVille? And I will stand before my God and I will give an account of how I live my life. And the excuses that seem very pliable down here may not be as pliable up there. When I stand before the one whose hands are pierced and his feet are pierced. And it inspires me. The book of Revelation inspires me to wake up and quit messing around, making excuses. And that it's not about me. That there's a spiritual war raging and I need to get off that bench and get in the game. This is the fourth quarter. We're getting close to the two minute drill. I realize that all scripture is inspired by God. But the book of Revelation is special. The Bible says this, listen, in Revelation 1.3, Blessed, a blessing falls upon him that will read, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. God promises you a spiritual blessing if you'll simply show up on Wednesday night and listen to Brother Sam, read it. <laughs> read it with me, you get a double blessing. Because you're reading it and you're hearing it. And then if you'll jump over that broomstick and start to do it, my soul, you're going to get a triple blessing. No other book in the Bible promises you a specific blessing if you will simply read that scripture. Revelation does. Blessed is he that will read, that will hear, that will keep the words of these sayings. You know, it's amazing because except for maybe the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament, which we avoid like the plague. Uh, the book of Revelation, to most, many people, is a scary book. Ooh, this is you, you can't. And, and the devil tries to get us to think we can't understand it or that it's a mysterious book because he knows if you'll simply read it that you'll be inspired and you'll be blessed. So no, we're not scared to read God's Word. We may not understand everything in it, but there are a lot of books. I don't understand everything in it, but that's not going to keep me from preaching it and act like I know everything in it. <laughs> so here's the really great part. The revelation of Jesus Christ is meant to impress you. 
So, so he, this is the key. This is the key to understanding the book of Revelation because there's a lot of disturbing events that are described in this book. A lot of disturbing events. If you understand, you know what I'm talking about. The Bible says the sun's going to turn black and the moon's going to turn blood red. That's, that's spooky. Hornets from hell will ascend out of the bottomless pit and torment men. Hailstones, some weighing 75 pounds. Can you imagine a hailstone weighing 75 pounds falling from the sky? A third of the trees and the green grass will burn up during this period of time. Saints will be martyred. Those saints that have given their heart to Christ that refuse to take the mark of the beast will have their heads removed from their shoulders. The oceans will die. The fresh water will turn bitter. Enormous numbers of people will die during the last days. Literally, according to the Word of God, by the billions in a very short period of time. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was talking in the Olivet Discourse. He said, For then shall be great tribulations, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. In other words, Jesus said, take any period in history, the bubonic plague, World War I, World War II, you name it, pick any time, and this is going to be worse. That's the words of Jesus. And he said, except I stopped it, every human being would perish during this period of time. That's how bad it will be. Now, this information <laughs> would cause any thinking person to have to take a half baby aspirin before you take a nap in the afternoon. I'm just telling you. I mean, it stir you up. It, it, it gets you trouble unless you understand that that stuff is not meant to impress you. What's meant to impress you is the description of Jesus. That's why we've got chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5 before we get to chapter 6. Because you're supposed to be so overwhelmed, so impressed by the description of Jesus Christ that you've got your eyes fixed on the glorified Christ and you're just absolutely overwhelmed that when these circumstances take place, you go, they don't mean nothing. I got my eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Yeah. Have you ever been overwhelmed? That somebody just, I mean, you went, oh. And, and immediately it inspired you to do something. See, I went to Navy boot camp in 1978, and, and I got on an airplane. I flew out to San Diego, California, and they took me by bus to the recruit training center over in San Diego base. And they said, you know, it's getting kind of late, so y'all bunk down, and you got a busy day tomorrow, so y'all have a good night's sleep. All right? So that's what happened when I got to San Diego, California. And I did sleep good. The bed was surprisingly comfortable. And I was in a room with a hundred other guys, so uh, there were a hundred of us, and we were all sleeping real peacefully until about four in the morning. And at four in the morning, we met our company commander for the first time. And he came in, and he picked up a metal garbage can, and it was like there were 50 guys on one side, 50 guys on the other side, in the hallway in between, and he hurled that garbage can down the middle. And I was so impressed with his ability to curse and scream and, and his ability to pitch garbage cans because Everyone he came in contact with, he pitched down that hallway, and brother, at 4 o'clock in the morning, normally, I won't bother God at 4 o'clock in the morning, but 4 o'clock in the morning, brother, I was standing straight and tall, my eyes wide open, and I was impressed by that guy. But even more so, I'm impressed by Jesus. He impresses me. The revealed description of Jesus Christ is meant to overwhelm you, to inspire you, so that when these circumstances come, you don't have your eyes on the circumstances, you got them on the Christ. So now we're going to look at the person of Christ, because there are over 35 titles and descriptions of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. It's literally like we've got this picture of Christ on The Chosen, okay, or we watch a TV or a movie or something like that. But now the curtain's being pulled back and we're going, wow, I had no idea. 
He is the Christ, the Christos. He is the Messiah. He is the only one. The next one coming will be a false one. It will be the Antichrist stood beside a false prophet. So there's only one Christ. He is the Christ, literally God incarnate, the deliverer of our salvation, the one who washed our sins away by his own blood. He is the faithful witness, the embodiment of truth. He will never tell a lie. He's the first begotten of the dead. He is the champion over death, hell, and the grave. He is the champion. Because always before, the thing we had to look forward to, no matter how successful you were, was death. The grave, which never was filled up, would always take another person. But Jesus beat the grave. Jesus beat death, hell, and the grave. In fact, the Bible says he holds the keys to hell in his hand. He's got them. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. That word for prince is archon. It means he is the chief one. He's the big dog. He's over all the kings of the earth. Jesus is the king of kings. And the Lord of lords, according to the book of Revelation, is stamped on his thigh. That's his name. That's who he is. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In Revelation 19, the Bible says that the heavens are rolled back like a scroll. And Jesus is riding a white stallion. And on his head, he is crowned with many crowns because he is the archon of all kings. Hey, Calvin, how you doing, bub? I love Calvin. This is my buddy. I'm so glad y'all came to worship today. I didn't mean to. You doing good? Good. Y'all need to say hi to Calvin before he leaves today. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. In other words, what that's saying is, from A to Z, every word that starts from A to Z in the dictionary, he is the originator of everything from A to Z. Amen. Oh, giraffe, he's the originator. Human, originator. Monkey, originator. Tree, originator. Pecans, he originated. He created all things. He maintains all things in existence. And if anything is to end, he will be the end of all things. He is the beginning of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. He is the end of all things. And if that doesn't impress you, I don't know what would impress you. Jesus is eternal. Past, present, future. Always has been always will be, and currently is. He is the I am, and it's spoken of in the book of Revelation. He is the I am. He is the Almighty, all omnipotent, all-powerful. Now, there are some people that impress me. They got those big guns, and boy, they work out all the time. You grab their arm, you go, my soul. But Jesus is almighty, all-powerful. The Bible says he walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The candle, golden candlesticks are the churches. He's talking about the seven churches of Asia Minor, which basically says this. He walks among us. He's in our midst. He's watching how you worship. He's watching how you treat one another. He's watching how you love your wife and how you submit to the authority of your husband. He's watching how you give. He's watching how you pray, whether you're looking around at the ceiling or whether you're actually praying in reaching the throne room of Almighty God. He's watching. He's walking in our midst and watching what's taking place among us. His eyes are a flame of fire. There's a golden sash across his chest. His feet burn with fine brass like judgment. His countenance looks like looking into the sun. And the Bible says when John, who had walked with him for three and a half years, his disciple, his disciple that was called the beloved disciple, when John saw him in his glorified state, he fell on his face. As if dead. Passed smooth out. Oh. When we read chapter 1, when we comprehend who our Savior really is, the events no longer scare me. That's why we see the bigger picture of Christ, the line of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God that was slain, that all heaven bows down and begins to cry, Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and power and strength. And that should impress you. 
and that it should inspire you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, Wherefore, seeing we are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that will so easily beset us, and let us run the race with patience, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Quit looking at the crowd. Quit looking at the folks eating hot dogs. You need to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Quit looking at the circumstances. Oh, poor pitiful me. Somebody stole my Coles cash and I lost it. Quit looking at the circumstances. You need to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because things are going to get bad. When it get bad, it would be easy to look at the storm like Peter and begin to sink. But you're not going to look at the storm. You're going to put your eyes on Jesus Christ and walk by faith. That's why you got to get the first five chapters before you get to chapter 6. That's good preaching, isn't it? Whew. Boy, I can't wait till Wednesday night. <laughs> you know, Jesus never promised to keep me from all persecution or tribulation. He did promise to never leave me or forsake me, though. He's always with me. So then we come to not just the person of Christ, but the preparation of the church. Revelation is meant to inform us and to impress us and inspire us and to overwhelm us with the description of Christ. But the thesis, the thesis of the book of Revelation, the central idea from chapter 1 to chapter 22 is, is so incredible because the, the thesis is he's coming back. <laughs> so all the events and all the descriptions and all the stuff... The whole point is this wonderful, incredible Savior whose face is like the sun, whose feet are like burning brass, his eyes are like flames of fire, is coming back. And we better be ready. We better be prepared. Of the 1,326 times in the Bible that the Bible uses the word behold, which I love, the last two are found in the final chapter of Revelation 22. So y'all know when we get to behold, we go, behold. Because it's meant to grab your attention. God's saying, pay attention to this. So the last two times we have behold. Let me read them to you, Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Again, repeating what we saw in chapter 1. Behold, verse 12, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his work as he shall be. There will be an accounting, a reckoning when he comes back. Last words of Jesus in the Bible that are in red. He which testifieth of these things saith, Surely, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, the bride replies, come Lord Jesus. In the first chapter, Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keepeth those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. And you may say, well, see, they wrote that almost 2,000 years ago and nothing's happened since that time. But what that says is we are in the epoch of time. We are in the season when Jesus is coming back. Now, we may be in the first part. We may be in the middle part. We may be at the end part. I think we're at the end part. I think we're getting close to the two-minute drill, but I'm not sure. But what it says is this season, this epoch of time will not end until Jesus comes back. We're in that season. And if Revelation teaches us anything, it's that we should be prepared after Jesus asked the question, when will you return? What are the signs of your return? He gave those signs, and then he ended with some parables. He said, remember the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise virgins and were prepared for the return of the bridegroom. They had lots of oil. They, they, they had filled their lamps with oil. Five were foolish virgins. They were not prepared. And therefore, they were left outside. And they knocked on the door, let us in, let us in. No, it's too late. It tells another story about 
a man that was the master, and he went to his servants. He said, listen, I'm going to go on a long trip, so I'm going to give one of you five talents. I'm going to give one of you two talents, and I'm going to give one of you one talent, big coins. So he gave one five coins, he gave another two coins, he gave another one coin, and he went on a long journey. And when they least expected it, he came back. And he said, all right, Mr. Man with the five coins, what did you do with those five talents? He said, I invested them wisely in the kingdom, and I have five more. I got ten talents. And Jesus said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little, I'll make you ruler over much. Hey, Mr. Man, you with two talents, what did you do with those two talents? He said, I invested them wisely in the kingdom of God, and therefore I've got four talents. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful a little, I'll make you ruler over much. He said, Mr. Man, with one talent, what did you do with that one talent? He said, I hid it. I buried it. I sat on it. I didn't do nothing. I didn't join the choir. I didn't teach the children. I didn't go on a mission trip. I never witnessed anybody. Never invited anybody to church. Didn't go to Sunday school. I didn't do nothing. Now, I didn't lose it. I just didn't use it. Jesus said, take it from him. You wicked and you slothful servant. How dare you sit on that talent when you knew I was coming back and would be asking you what you did with it. Luke 21, 36, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We will stand before God, and I will give an account of my time. I will give an account of what I did behind this sacred desk. I will give an account of my prayer life. And to be honest with you, it scares me. Matthew chapter 25, he ends this section with a very familiar passage of Scripture. Let me read part of it to you, okay? He says, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, when He returns, Revelation 19, heavens are rolled out like a scroll, Jesus is riding on a white stallion, the armies of heaven are behind Him on white horses, clothed in white linen, fine and clean, His eyes are aflame, His mouth has a double-edged sword going forth with which he will smite the nations in his wrath. And he will rule with a rod of iron. When he comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all the nations and they will separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. I'm sorry, y'all sat on the wrong side today. Then will king, the king say to them on his right hand, this is what he's going to say. And he cannot lie, he's a faithful and true witness. This is what's going to take place. He's going to gather everybody together. Those on the right are saved. Those on the left are lost. Then will the king say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. You came unto me. Then will the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I send to you as much as you have done it to one of the least of these, my brethren. You have done it even unto me. Here's the question. Are you prepared to stand before God and say, you know, God, I did go visit the hospital. <coughs> Not just my immediate family. When I found out somebody was sick and I knew them, I went up there and had prayer with them. I prayed over them. I do feed the hungry. I do try to make sure that people that don't have water get water. People that are naked get clothed. Do you? I'm just asking a question because that's what he's going to say. And then he's going to turn to those on the left and say, you know, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't even care. I was naked and you never gave me any clothes to wear. I was in the hospital. You never visited me. I was in prison. You never cared. You didn't, you didn't give a hoot. You didn't do nothing. You didn't do nothing. 
You know, here's the thing. This is really neat because if you say, oh, man, I don't think. If, if you're a member of Flint Baptist Church, do you know who the number one giver, the biggest giver to Noonday Food Pantry is? You are. When you put a dollar in the offering plate, part of that goes to the Noonday Food Pantry to feed thousands of people every single year. Do you know this past year, Brother Park got a bunch of shoppers together, and, and, and they put together thousands of dollars. They went out shopping and put together thousands of dollars of gifts for people who otherwise wouldn't have any kind of a Christmas whatsoever. Do you know that we sent out over 500 shoe boxes full of toys and gifts and stuff to 250 down to Belize and 250 more we, we sent to the Philippines? And little children that otherwise would get absolutely nothing, not even a stocking full of a grapefruit and walnuts like we used to get when we were children, got a box that was like the biggest treasure they've ever received in their life in the name of Jesus Christ, you did that because you gave, because you cared. You've given backpacks to kids that otherwise would have no backpack at Legacy High School. You minister to the teachers at Griffin. You have no idea. We spent over a million dollars in missions this past year, and it was because you were willing to give. Wow. But God's going to ask us. And it can't just be, well, I know the church is doing it. Well, that's great, but what are you doing? <laughs> are you going to the hospital? Are you writing notes to people that are in prison? What are you doing? Because God did not save you and give you no talent. He gave you something. He gave you a charismata. He gave you a gift, and it's not to be just sat on. And that should inspire you to be prepared for when Jesus comes back. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, The trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And the question is, are you prepared? Are you prepared to leave everything behind? Because you're not taking anything with you. To say, that stuff doesn't mean anything to me. Jesus means more to me than anything down here on this earth. I'm going to end with this old song. The writer wrote, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I'll be honest with you guys. I'm overwhelmed by Jesus. That's why I do what I do. I mean, I love you guys, and it's fun being a pastor. But there's some days it's not very fun to be a pastor. And the reason I keep doing it is because my Lord Jesus Christ has absolutely, completely overwhelmed me. Amen. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus? If not, let 2024 be the year that you wake up every morning and you put your eyes squarely on Christ and you get amazed at who he is. And it'll blow your mind. I'm going to ask you to bow your head.